Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. Section 29. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites, by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 12. The Sasso Bianco, Part 1. An ill-favored thing, sir, says Touchstone, the article in question being a lady, but mine own. Now, I will not say that the Sasso Bianco is an ill-favored mountain, heaven forbid, nor that it is an unimportant mountain, nor even that it is a small mountain. I will not deprecate it at the beginning in order to rehabilitate it by a coup de theatre in the end. Neither will I affect to undervalue it for the sake of establishing an ingenious parallel between myself and the fool. At the same time, I am anxious not to exaggerate its peculiar qualifications and virtues. For it is with mountaintops as with other playthings. Having sought to achieve them in the first instance because we value them, we go on valuing them because we have achieved them. We may even admit their ill-favoredness, as Touchstone admits the ill-favoredness of Audrey, but we are apt at the same time to overestimate them in secret, simply because they are our own. I premise, therefore, that I am not blindly in love with the Sasso Bianco, and that the following portrait is not flattered. I cannot better describe the Sasso Bianco than by adopting the words of Clementi. It is not a mountain of the first class, but it is high for a mountain of the second class. It is, for instance, 2,000 feet, if not 2,200 feet, higher than the Rigi, and about 240 feet higher than the Nisan. Its summit stands about 200 feet higher above the lake of Eleghi than the summit of Monte Generosa above the lake of Lugano. It rises considerably above the tree line and falls just short of the snow level. That is to say, we found one unmelted snowdrift about 100 feet below the summit, and there may have been others which we did not see lurking in inaccessible fissures and crevices. The snow was firm and pure, but the quantity insignificant. As regards position, I know of no minor Swiss mountain to which I can accurately compare the Sasso Bianco. The Rigi is a mere outlying sentinel, and the view it commands is too distant to be very striking. The same may be said of Monte Generosa, despite its unparalleled panoramic range. The Egeshorn view is all on one side. The Gornergrat, unrivaled as a near view over snow and ice, is too circumscribed. But the Sasso Bianco stands in the very center of the Dolomites, like the middle ball upon a solitaire board, surrounded on all sides by the giants of the district. If one could imagine a fine, detached mountain, clear on all sides, occupying, say, the position of the village of Luc in the valley of the Rhone, and high enough to command the whole circuit of the Oberland, Monte Rosa, and Mont Blanc Rages, that mountain would fairly represent the kind of position which the Sasso Bianco holds in reference to the scenery by which it is encompassed. I am not acquainted with the view from the Bella Tola in the valley of the Rhone, but judging from its situation on the map, it seems just possible that it may supply exactly the parallel of which I am in search. The mass of Monte Pesa is of considerable extent. Counting from the points locally known as Monte Alto on the west and Monte Forca on the east, and from the Val Petorina on the north to the valley of the Buas on the south, it must cover a space of nearly three and a half miles in length by two and a half in breadth. These, of course, are only rough measurements derived partly from personal observation and partly based upon the Austrian ordnance map. In superficial extent as well as in height, the Sasso Bianco, or more properly the Monte Pesa, much exceeds the Monte Mignon, the Monte Frisolet, and Monte Fernanza. Of the geology of the mountain I am not competent to form an opinion, but according to Ball's geological map it is composed in part of Porphyry and in part of Triassic, the light-colored cliffs of the summit facing north, being the part especially designated as the Sasso Bianco, are probably dolomite. Both in color and in texture the rock appears, at all events, to be of one piece with that of which the great Primiero and Empezo peaks are composed. Of course we decided upon making the ascent almost as soon as we found ourselves back at Caprile. The way up, though long, seemed to be sufficiently easy. 
There were many paths and char tracks leading from the valley of Alleghe to the farmlands and hamlets scattered along the eastern side of the mountain. But Clementi recommended a path starting from the Val Peterina, along which we must ride, he said, as far as the highest pastures, and to within about an hour of the summit. As regarded time, he calculated that from four to five hours, including the last hour on foot, would take us from Caprile to the summit. All this sounded pleasant enough, so it was arranged that Giuseppe should watch the weather and rouse the household at three a.m. whenever a favorable morning should offer. At length, on the morning of the fourth day after our return, the weather being apparently favorable, Giuseppe gave the signal a little before dawn, and by five a.m. we were upon our way. A more lovely morning we have never yet had. The grass, the wild flowers, the trees, all are drenched with dew and sparkling in the sun. The birds seem wild with delight, and are singing like mad upon the wet green leaves. Crossing the wooden bridge, and taking the familiar road up the little Val Petorina, as if going to Sotaguda, we hear the bells of Rocca ringing high up in the still air, and pass group after group of peasants in their holiday clothes making for the hill. For it is a festa this bright morning, and the annual Segro is held at Rocca today. Men and women alike pull off their hats as we ride by. All wish us good morning, and none fail to ask where we are going. Turning away presently from the beaten path, we then strike down to the water's edge, the mules picking their way along the loose stones bordering the bed of the Petarina torrent. Skirting thus the base of the hill on which Rocca is built, we cross a higher bridge and plunge at once into the shade of the fir woods at the northward base of Monte Pesa. The path, which is steep and stony, then winds round to the east, and brings us out upon a space of cultivated farmlands, just overhanging the Cordeval. Here dark fir-woods slope in shade down to the valley below, and higher fir-woods climb the mountainside above, while between both a belt of green cornfields, lighted here and there by fiery sparks of scarlet poppies, ripples in the breeze and the sunshine. Peeping up yonder, just beyond the brink of the woods, rises the spire of Caprile, while further still a faint ghost of white vapor soars lazily up from the direction of Alleghi. Presently a lark springs out, full-voiced, from his nest in the barley, and a troop of children, their little brown hands full of poppies and cornflowers, come chasing each other down the mountainside. Such, indeed, is the idyllic beauty of the whole scene that even L, who, with a culpable indifference to glory which it grieves me to record, was more than half inclined to stay at home, is moved to admiration, and admits that, were it to see no more than this, she is glad to have come. Meanwhile we follow a series of narrow footways winding among fields of young wheat, barley, flax, and hemp. Dark Nestle, a confirmed kleptomaniac, grabs huge mouthfuls right and left, and leaves a trail of devastation behind him. Fair Nestle, on the contrary, looks and longs, but obeying the light hand on his bridle, abstains regretfully. Presently we leave the fields behind, and mount again into the shade of the forest. Here and there, where the path is very steep, we dismount and walk. Still higher we emerge upon a zone of rich grassland full of busy haymakers, and learn that all this part belongs to Signora Pezzi. Twenty-four such pasturages are yet hers, but half the mountainside belonged to the family in the old times passed away. From this point, and for a long way up, the pasture land is like a lovely park, rich in grass and interspersed with clumps of firs and larches. As the path rises, however, the trees diminish and the wild flowers become more abundant. Soon we are in the midst of a hanging garden, thick with white and yellow violets, forget-me-nots, great orange and turkscap lilies, wild sweet peas, wild sweet william, and purple canterbury bells. Here, too, we make acquaintance for the first time with a grotesque, ugly flower bearing a kind of fibrous crest, like a top knot of spider's legs. They call it Capelli di Dio, or God's Hair. The forget-me-not is here called Fior di Santa Lucia, or St. Lucy's Flower, and the white clover, known only as a wild flower in South Tyrol, is the Fior di San Giovanni, or flower of St. John. Looking back now towards Monte Mignon, I see that we have long ago overtopped the Sasso di Ranch, which from here looks no bigger than a milestone, and that we are already higher than the highest ridge of Monte Frisolet. 
Meanwhile, however, the morning dews keep rising in white, vaporous masses from the depths of the valley below, threatening before long to intercept the view. If they should rise to our own level when once we are at the top, as they seem only too likely to do, it is plain that our chances of a panoramic view are lost beyond redemption. And now the wild flower zone is left below, and the path, which here circles round a vast amphitheater in the mountainside, gets very steep, and strikes up towards the last pasturages. Steep as it is, however, and hewn in places out of the slippery rock, the farmers have for centuries contrived to drag their rough caratini up and down when the highest hay is gathered. The rock is even worn into deep ruts, just as the pavement of the Via Triumphalis is channeled by Roman chariot wheels, where it climbs the steep verge of Monte Cavo. Here the mules scramble on first, and reaching the green levels above, set off on their own accord. In vain Clementi runs and shouts after them. They trot resolutely on, till, reaching a little hollow among bushes and deep grass, they bury their noses in a cool rill which they had scented from afar off. Clementi, coming up red and breathless, wrenches their heads out of the water, and overwhelms them with reproaches. Holy Mother! What do they mean by not minding when they are spoken to? Holy Mother! What do they mean by drinking cold water when they are as hot as two hot cakes in an oven? Sacramento! Do they want to fall ill and die, out of mere spite towards a master who loves them? Eh, long years! Are they deaf? Ah, oh, monsters of mules! Do they not understand Italian? It is a long, grassy, trough-shaped plateau, with a few gnarled, bloodless old pines scattered about, and two or three tumble-down chalets. Here the char-track ends, but we take the mules on a good way farther still, up a steep pitch at the far end of the pasture alp, and out at last upon a broad ridge terminated towards the northeast by a long slope and an upright wall of rock, like a line of fortification. To right and left, this ridge dips away into unfathomable chasms of misty valley. To the southwest it runs down to join the great woods which clothe all the western mass of Monte Pesa. There is nothing, in short, above the point which we have now reached, save the slope leading to the summit. But where is the summit? Seeing us look eagerly towards the rock wall above, Clementi laughs and shakes his head. Ah, no, signoras, he says, non ancora. We must leave the mules here, but from this point we have an hour's walking before us. The cima is yonder, seven or eight hundred feet higher. It proves, however, to be over a thousand. The mists, alas, are now swirling up on this side with frightful rapidity. The Val Petorina and all the Sotogura side are hidden by the slope above, but the Val d'Alleghi and the Civita and all the peaks lying to the southwest of our position are now only visible in snatches as the vapors drift in part. The Val Bois, looking over towards Sensenigi and the Cima de Pap, is like a huge cauldron sending up volumes of swift steam. To go on at present is obviously useless, so we make armchairs of the saddles and rest a while upon the grass, while the mules graze and the men, who have had more than four hours climbing, light their cigars and lie down in the shade of a big boulder. Up here we are already above the tree level. Glowing alp roses and dark blue gentians abound, but the grass all about grows thin and hungerly. According to the aneroid, and without allowing anything for corrections, we have already left Caprile more than 3,500 feet below. That is to say, we have attained an elevation 200 feet higher than the Fadaha Pass, and between 20 and 30 feet higher than the Tresasi Pass, where it will be remembered we reached the snow level. Half an hour is consumed thus, in calculating heights, examining maps, and watching the progress of the mists. Sometimes the sun breaks through, and then they part for a moment and drive off in rolling masses. Sometimes they rush up as if chased by the wind, sweeping all across the ridge, blinding us in white fog, and leaving clinging damp behind them. At length we decide to push on for the summit. Clementi, who knows this climate, thinks it may clear off at midday, and that we may as well be upon the spot to take advantage of any sudden change for the better. It is now 10.20 a.m., and we have an hour's climbing before us. Meanwhile, a little lad who has been picked up on the way is left in charge of the mules, 
with strict injunctions not to let them stray near the edge of the precipice on either side a duty which he fulfills by immediately lying down upon his face in the damp grass and falling sound asleep. End of section 29